welcome to our first video on the cyclotron. We will have two parts to this. This part is all about the electric field side of things and then later on once we've covered magnetic fields we'll come back and we'll look at the magnetic aspect of it. So for now we're just going to focus on the electric side of the cyclotron. This lesson there's a few expected outcomes. Firstly um, understanding that in a cyclotron the electric field in the gap between the D's increases the speed of these charged particles. You're expected to describe how an electric field between the Ds can transfer energy to an ion passing between them. Describe how the ions could be accelerated to very high energies. If they could be made to repeatedly move across an electric field, calculate the energy transferred to an ion each time it passes between the Ds and explain why the ions do not gain kinetic energy when inside the Ds. So we'll explain all of this during this lesson. A bit of background information. Technetium, which is atomic number 98, was the first artificial element to be discovered. We use it for a range of things. It's a remarkable corrosion inhibitor for steel. This corrosion protection is limited to closed systems since technetium is radioactive and must be confined. So for anything that's not exposed to the outside environment or to people, such as a closed system, um, we can use this technetium and it's a really good corrosion inhibitor. Something like chrome and stuff like that is really good as well, but it's significantly heavier and potentially more expensive. So if we don't care about the fact that it's radioactive, we can use this as an alternative. It's also an excellent superconductor at 11 Kelvin, which in Celsius is negative 262 degrees. So we can use it as a superconductor. Its most useful isotope, however, is technetium TC99. This has a half-life of about six hours which may sound kind of useless, like it's only going to be around for six hours more or less, and then it's gone. But we use this in medical radioactive isotope tests because of the short half-life. So it doesn't spend a lot of time in your body, and it doesn't really have a lot of time to affect you. Technetium's ability to be chemically bound to many biological active molecules is its other really useful thing. So we can combine it with stuff and make these technetium compounds. And this is what we use in medical science and medical physics quite a lot. This is one of the other bonuses of the technetium. Technetium-99 is used in 20 million diagnostic nuclear medical procedures every single year. 85% of these, um, in all these procedures that are done in the nuclear medicine, use this isotope as the radioactive tracer. So 20 million per year, um, that's a lot. That's, that shows the importance and the significance of this element. There's only two places, though, that we can get it. We can either go to the inside of a star, and it needs to be a very specific star, something like a neutron star or um, a paired neutron star orbiting each other. The other place we can get it is a cyclotron. So one of these is much cheaper and much more feasible to get, something that's super beneficial. So they mix it, more or less, in long story short, they get this technetium compound, they mix it into a solution, they inject it into the body, I'll then put you through a special radioactive scanner, like a PET scan or a PET scan or something like that. That'll pick up the radiation in the body, and then they'll look at it through the computers, and you can see in the little picture on the left there, um, and a better picture down here, these are some examples of what you may see. So you can see these lit up areas of radioactive substance that's in the body, and they can use that to analyze blockages or inflammation in, in digestive tracts. They can look for lumps and tumors and cancers and all these kinds of things. So it's a really useful tool. And that's why they call it a radioactive tracer, because they can trace the chemical passing through the body and they can use it to identify things. Again, because it's got a very short half-life of six hours, doesn't have a lot of time to be in there and damaging the body and affect you. It's sort of in, in there and then within six hours, it's already starting to decompose quite rapidly. So that's what we want. But you've also got enough time to get it in and get your scans done. A big limitation with this though is that if it's got a six hour half-life, that's six hours from the time it's made. So if we use a cyclotron to build it, six hours later we've already lost half the substance. So in terms of transporting it, it's not particularly feasible. We're not going to import this from another country. Even getting it from interstate is very, very complicated because you know it's a, an hour or two to freight it in, then you've got to use it straight away. You can't just have a fridge full of technetium. So for most cases, big hospitals and almost every state, we need to have our own cyclotron so that we can make it in-house as required. Sometimes charged particles need to be accelerated to very high speeds in order to study their structure and their components. 
This is used in a wide range of pursuits, including medical research and the study of nuclear physics. We're all using these very high energy particles, and the high energy is correlated with a very high speed. The energy that we need to actually examine a particle is in the order of giga electron volts. So the particle is passing through something like a thousand volts 10,000 times. If we use that um, delta V sort of concept, we need a 1000 volt potential difference and it has to pass through it 10,000 times. We could flip that and you could pass it through one time, but then you would need like a hundred thousand or almost a million volts in order to do that. So in this case, it's more practical to have a reasonable voltage source like a thousand volts and pass it through lots and lots of times. In order to do this, we need a cyclotron of an enormous size to be able to generate this sort of electric field potential and to be able to have enough space and control to whiz around 10,000 times. The picture below is a cyclotron, the Triumph, uh, in Canada, and this is a 17.1 meter diameter cyclotron, so that's pretty big. The first ever cyclotron was invented by Ernest Lawrence in 1931. He didn't work in isolation, he actually had an assistant, Milton Stanley Livingston, and the image below on the left shows Lawrence standing next to an early built model in around 1932. For comparison, the right hand side shows a modern cyclotron. This one itself is located in Sydney, um, and you can see there's no person to compare to, but we're looking a little bit more technical by this point, but when you think about it, we've had this technology since back in 1931. It's important to know that a cyclotron is different to a Large Hadron Collider. Very similar in concept in that we're speeding up particles, we're using electric fields and magnetic fields, but they're not quite the same. A cyclotron uh, or cyclotrons are a type of particle accelerator that are small scale, and they focus on creating an isotope or a synthetic element, whereas a Large Hadron Collider is creating very, very high energy particles and they're smashing them into each other to generate new things or um, observe the effects. In this case, a cyclotron's main purpose is actually to create an isotope. The picture down the bottom shows an example of the isotopes of hydrogen. So some quick chemistry for you. An isotope is something that is an atom or an element that has more or less neutrons than it normally would. So in this case, we can pump neutrons into it, an atom, and we go from protium, then we add one and we get deuterium, and then if we add another neutron, we get tritium, which is the two neutrons, one proton version of hydrogen. Still hydrogen because it has one proton, and that's what defines the element, but the neutrons can be changed, and that's how we get the isotopes. So this ties in a lot with that radioactive stuff. So a cyclotron, as we said before, is used to accelerate charged particles to very high energies, and it uses the properties of motion of a charged particle in both electric and magnetic fields. For now, we're just going to look at the electric field aspect, and then once we've covered magnetic fields, we'll come back and we'll talk about that aspect. Let's look at some parts to start with. The main component of a cyclotron is shown in the picture below. An electromagnet is placed above and below two hollow-shaped D copper conductors. And this is what we call the Ds. So when we refer to the Ds throughout the slides, these are these two hollow copper conductors that are split, and we've basically got two semicircles. This produces a uniform magnetic field inside the Ds between these electromagnets. The charged particles are accelerated by this electric field that's generated within the Ds, and they pass between the gap every time. The process repeats many, many times, and the charges eventually exit the, the cyclotron once they've accumulated a large amount of kinetic energy and speed as a result of this, because they're tidy. So it starts off in the middle, and as it starts to circle around, it gets faster and faster and faster, kind of like a centrifuge effect, and eventually it gets to the outside where it's got enough energy or enough speed that we can use it, and it either gets thrown out or we have a special device that ejects it from that point. The modern cyclotrons inject a small amount of hydrogen gas into this apparatus. An electric current heats a filament that releases electrons in the gap between the Ds. So we've got this hydrogen gas, an electric current heats a filament, and this releases the electrons. These electrons uh, that are emitted by the heated filament are accelerated by the electric field between the Ds. When they collide with the hydrogen molecules that are injected, they could eject 
one of the hydrogen uh, electrons. So we're basically generating these electrons in the filament, injecting hydrogen gas, accelerating the um, electrons through the field, and then smashing them into each other. So it's kind of that concept of the Hadron Collider, but in a very, very small scale, because we just want to eject um, one of the hydrogen ions, or eject one of the electrons to generate a hydrogen ion. Once you've got this hydrogen ion, this produce um, protons or a positive hydrogen ion, which we use that symbol H+. And this ion is therefore then injected into the space between the Ds. So that first process is just how we generate this charged particle, the hydrogen ion, by um, generating electrons in a hot filament, accelerating or injecting a, a hydrogen gas, and then basically making them smack into each other to try and knock out these electrons. This picture here shows um, an example of that. So we see that the particle is entered at point P. Between Q and R, it accelerates. So between the gap, every time it starts to accelerate, follows this circular path from R to S. So it's actually going this way. And eventually it gets faster and faster. It gets right out to the outside and it's thrown it out at a very, very high speed. Now let's look at the Ds. The Ds are two hollow semicircular containers made from a non-magnetic material such as copper because obviously if they were magnetic and we've got these large magnetic fields on the top and bottom, it would pull them towards them or it would interfere with the apparatus. So they need to be something that doesn't conduct um, in terms of magnetic fields. They're open at the diameter so the ions can pass freely from one D into the other. So they're just hollow. Given that the metal is non-magnetic, it doesn't interfere with the external magnetic field, and we'll cover that more once we do magnetic fields. And no electric field can be inside the Ds because they're a hollow conductor. So exactly as we talked about earlier, there's no electric charge or electric field generated inside a hollow conductor. It's all built up on the surfaces. If we generate an alternating potential between the Ds with a very high voltage supply, we're actually flipping the positive negative. So on each of the Ds, we attach a terminal, and it's rapidly switching between which one's positive, which one's negative. The whole apparatus is located in an evacuated container, which is also made from a non-magnetizable material. So we want the entire thing to be non-magnetic or it'll interfere with the field. And we want it to be in a vacuum, otherwise you've got air particles and other bits and pieces to slow down this thing whizzing around. So we're trying to simulate this isolated system. There is a potential difference in the gap between the Ds that produces a uniform electric field between them. So the Ds form basically a parallel plate. Given that they're hollow conductors, we've got a power source on either side that is alternating. We generate this electric field between the gaps because that's what an electric field is. It's a difference between the potentials on two plates and it generates that field in between. And if we alternate it, the field direction is constantly flipping back and forth. When the charged particle enters this electric field, it's accelerated because the electric field exerts a force on the charges, which is what we've talked about so far. So you've got a charged particle in electric field, it's accelerated towards the direction of the electric field. The magnitude of this force uh, by the electric field is the F equals QE, which we've covered. So the force on a charge is the charge times the electric field strength. If we use Newton's second law, the acceleration on that particle is therefore just the force divided by mass from F equals MA. And we can use these energy concepts to explain why the charges gain speed. The electric field does work on the charges, and so using the law of conservation of energy, the work done by the electric field is equal to the kinetic energy gained by the charges. Therefore, the electric field transfers kinetic energy to the charged particle or the ion. Given that it's doing work on it, it's transferring kinetic energy to it. So we can look at this formula and we start with the work equals Q times delta V formula. And then we can say that the work is also equal to the change in kinetic energy. So therefore, the Q delta V and the work is equal to the half mv squared. So we can suddenly relate the work, the charge and the change in velocity to the kinetic energy. And we can use this to figure out the velocities of a particle and things like that. It's important to know that the alternating potential is applied so that the particle is not fighting the field on the return jump. Otherwise, you would think if it's traveling in the direction shown by the spiral, it's accelerated this way, but then when it whizzes back around, it's actually fighting the field at this point and it would be slowed down. 
So the fear, the uh, potential difference is alternated strategically so that every time it comes back, it's in the right direction and then it flips and then it gets to here and it's moving again in the right direction. So it's constantly accelerating. It's never fighting the electric field direction. Since these charges are made to repeatedly cross this electric field, they're accelerated to high kinetic energies. Given that every time it passes, it's speeding up across the field and then it's looped back around and forced to do it again, it's constantly speeding up. This gain in kinetic energy is the charge times the change in potential. And that's every time it crosses the electric field. So that kinetic energy gain is the Q delta V from before. That's the work that's being done on the particle every time it jumps this gap. So if we think about how many times it crosses the gap, we could work out that the total kinetic energy gained by this charge by the time it leaves the cyclotron is just n times the kinetic energy that was given every time it jumps the gap. So we can say here that the Q delta V, the work done on it, is equal to the kinetic energy that it gains, and that's per um, gap jump. So if we said for n number of times, it's just going to gain n times Q delta V. So that's the total kinetic energy gained for n turns. That's how many cycles of the cyclotron it does. Once the charged particle passes into the D, the motion is influenced only by the magnetic field, which we'll talk about later. They're moving at right angles to this field, and therefore they follow a circular path inside the D. When they exit, they're again subject only to that electric field, and they accelerate. It's important to remember the electric field has changed direction due to the alternating potential, so it's always boosting the particle. It's never fighting it. Once these particles enter the D again, they're following a path of a greater radius than before due to their increased speed. So again, we'll talk about this in magnetic fields. But every time it speeds up, it's moving slightly further out every time. And this creates the spiral effect of the particle before it gets thrown out right at the very edge. So it's almost like the analogy of going around a roundabout and then as you speed up, you can't maintain the traction at the inner point, so you start doing bigger and bigger circles and you drift out. You end up creating this large spiral pattern. And I would like to address the issue, how do you accelerate protons to extremely high speeds, almost approaching the speed of light? And that is also something for which Ernest Lawrence is credited in the early days, it was done in a cyclotron, which I will describe to you now. The cyclotron consists of a chamber, which is called a D. This is one D, and here's another D. These are conducting chambers. If you look from the side, it would look like so. This is the left chamber and this is the right chamber, and all of this is in vacuum. And let's assume that we have a magnetic field coming out of the board, like so. so let's revisit our one MeV proton. Suppose I release in this chamber here a one MeV proton and I know the speed with which it comes out, because the one MeV proton had a speed, oh, you still see it there, 1.4 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. We also know that in a one Tesla field, let's make this one Tesla, that the radius is going to be 15 centimeters. You see it up there. So what is this proton going to do? It's going to do this. But when it gets there, a potential difference is introduced between these two D's, so that this is low po high potential and this is a low potential. And so you're going to get an electric field now in this gap, in this direction, and so this proton is being accelerated. And let's suppose that the difference in potential is 20 kilovolts. Then this proton will gain in electric, in kinetic energy, it will gain kinetic energy 20 kilo electron volt. That's the way electron volt is, de is defined. And so you start off with one MeV, so when it has crossed this gap, it is now 1.02 MeV, 20 keV more. The radius now is larger. 
if capital V is two percent higher, and I go to this equation, then the radius is one percent higher. And so when it comes out here and it makes a circle, the radius now is one percent higher than fifteen centimeters. But when it gets to this part of the D, this potential difference is reversed, and so the electric field is again in this direction, in the direction of the proton, and so it is accelerated again by twenty kilo electron volts. Now the radius, of course, is even larger, and so very gradually, every time that it reaches the gap, the potential difference is changed in direction to accelerate the proton, and so it gradually spirals out then to the largest radius uh, that you have. So during one full rotation, it gains twenty kilo electron volt once and twenty kilo electron volt twice, so it gains forty kilo electron volts. And so the electric fields are doing the work. They accelerate the particles. Magnetic fields cannot accelerate. Magnetic fields can change the direction, but they can do no work on the particles. So the magnetic fields confine the particles. So let's assume we go twelve hundred and twenty-five full rotations. During each rotation, the kinetic energy increased by forty keV. And so if you multiply the two, then you see now that the kinetic energy of this proton increased by forty-nine million electron volts. Because it went twelve hundred and twenty-five times all the way around. And so now you have forty-nine MeV plus the one MeV that you started with, so now you have a fifty MeV proton. You see the second line there? There we have that fifty MeV proton that I discussed with you earlier. In a one Tesla field, now the radius is one meter. So if this unit had a radius of one meter, that would be fine. By that time, it would be all the way near the circumference of this unit. So here's a worked example on what we've talked about so far. If we had an earlier cyclotron with a 12.5 centimeter diameter, the proton is accelerated and it completes 2,000 revolutions. The potential difference between the Ds is 5,000 volts. Firstly, calculate the kinetic energy of the proton when it leaves the cyclotron in both joules and mega electron volts. So remember your 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 conversion. And we've got N is 2,000 revolutions, potential difference is 5,000, and the diameter is 12.5 centimeters. So have a go at this. I'll give you the answer in a minute. So firstly we use the work is number of turns times Q delta V, 4,000 turns times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, that's the charge, because it's a proton, remember it has the opposite charge of an electron, but the number is the same, and we times it by the potential difference, 5,000. So we get 3.2 times 10 to the negative 12 joules, and then if we convert it, we get 20 mega electron volts. In part B, we want to know what is the speed of the protons that they left the cyclotron. We use the same sort of concept that the work done is Q delta V, and the Q delta V or the work is equal to the kinetic energy. So we substitute the half mv squared. And we rearrange for V, I get that V is two times the work done divided by the mass of the object. Work I calculated. Um, 2 times 3.2 times 10 to the minus 12. Then I divide it by the mass, it's the mass of a proton, and I get my 6.19 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. So that is moving extremely fast. 
These two questions are sample exam questions. So I pulled this out of um, the 2019 exam and you can see it's very, very similar. So using kinetic energy of half mv squared, show that the electron with a speed of that has a kinetic energy of that. So it's very similar to the problem we just did, but they just want you to show using all of that information. And you're given the answers, you just need to prove that it is true. Part B then says the electrons gained this kinetic energy by moving through a potential difference. Determine what the potential difference is that increased the kinetic energy of the electrons by that. So this is working backwards. Using the same concept, if you know what the potential increase was, calculate what the potential difference um, on that electric field is. Question 5 then has a diagram of a cyclotron, briefly explains how it works, etc. Um, they then tell you to explain why it's necessary for the electric field to continuously reverse direction. So it's important that you can explain that concept in terms of it needs to constantly be boosting the um, charged particle rather than fighting it in one side and then uh, boosting it in the other side. And then the second part says to describe how an electric field between the Ds can transfer energy to a proton, proton passing between them. So this is all about how is it transferring energy. It's doing work on the proton. It's doing work because there's a potential difference and there's some electric field. So the electric field is doing the work on the energy, uh, sorry, on the particle. That then generates its energy and it transfers to the proton every time it passes through the Ds. There's no magnetic field or, sorry, there's no electric field inside the Ds. So no work is done there. So it's only when it jumps this potential gap. But something along those lines is what they're looking for there. We will come back and revisit the cyclotron once we've done the magnetic field topic and it ties in the second part of this. For now, we're just focusing on this electric side. So that concludes the part one of the cyclotron. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. There is a lot of information there in terms of the parts, what it's doing, how it operates. But I guess in the most basic sense, you just need to understand that you've got an electric field. For now, that's all we're focusing. You've got two charged objects with an electric field between them. It's accelerating an object every time it passes up over the gap. The gap is constantly changing electric field direction so that it's constantly accelerating. Um, for reasons that we'll cover later, it starts to spiral as it moves faster and faster inside these two half spheres or half disks. And then eventually it gets to a point where it's so fast that it's thrown out the end at very, very high energy. Given that the electric field is doing work on the particle to accelerate it, the particle is gaining kinetic energy, and therefore by the time it leaves, it's gained a large amount of energy and it becomes a very fast, very high energy particle from when it started. We can then use this to generate things like high energy um, synthetic substances, and this, where that, this is where that technetium comes in that I mentioned at the start. This is how we synthesize it for medical use.